side to commitment that isn't talked about very much. The danger that you have to face if you're going to be one of the ones who are really committed to following Jesus. If you aren't, if you're just going to be kind of committed, committed enough to be called a Christian, to be included in the tribe, to be saved and forgiven, but not much beyond that, then you may not have to worry about this. You have other stuff you should worry about, but not this. But for those who have the good sense to pursue Jesus with heart, mind, and soul, there's a real danger that must be faced and mastered. Because if it isn't, you can find yourself in the strange position of actually opposing Jesus while pursuing him earnestly. To show you what I mean, Let's look at the poster child of extremely committed, and that's the Apostle Peter. He was the most committed disciple of all the 12, and all you had to do to learn that was ask him and he'd tell you. According to Peter, Jesus invited him up the mountain to witness the transfiguration. James and John were just along for the ride. The same when Jesus went into the house to heal the synagogue leader, Jairus' daughter. Peter, James, and John were invited to accompany him and no one else. And, Peter will remind you, no other disciple ever walked on water. Sure, he only got a few feet away before he started to sink, but at least he got out of the boat. Perhaps no other episode displays Peter's zeal in following Jesus than his confession at Caesarea Philippi. It's found in both Matthew and Mark's Gospels. We're going to read Mark's version, and we'll bring in Matthew as needed. So let's look at Mark 8, and we'll start with verses 27 through 30. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Now, here you clearly see Peter stepping up to the head of the class. Everybody else got the easy question. Hey, what's the buzz? What's my reputation? What's everybody saying about me? But when it gets personal, Peter steps up. Now, maybe he's just the first to answer, and someone like John would have answered the same. Maybe the other 11 disciples all had their hands raised, hoping Jesus would call on them so that they could shine, and Peter just blurts it out without raising his hand. Who knows? But, but here's where Mark and Matthew go in different directions. In Matthew's version, Peter is singled out by Jesus, the implication being that only Peter was capable of giving the correct answer because it had been revealed to him and only him. So take a look at Matthew 16, verses 16 and 17. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And then Jesus gives him the nickname that he became known by forever. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Peter, of course, means rock. And what eventually became the Roman Catholic Church used this to signify that Peter himself became the foundation of the church. And so when he became Bishop of Rome, that made the person in that position, now known as the Pope, the head of the church, after Christ, of course. Now, non-papists will say, no, Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that's the rock that formed the foundation of the church. And that's a fair point, except Jesus didn't call the confession the rock, he called Peter the rock. But he probably didn't mean that Peter himself and all his ecclesiastical heirs were going to sit at the top of a great bureaucratic hierarchy to rule over the whole worldwide church. I mean, Jesus was about tearing down hierarchies, not establishing them. So it, it's probably a combination of the two. The church isn't built upon a confession, even one as great as this. The church is built upon people. People are the foundation of the church, but it's people who recognize who Jesus is and what he is about and commit themselves to both of these things that become the bedrock foundation of the church. And that's just it. It's a commitment to both of these things, recognizing who Jesus is and what he is about. And 
It's the latter that can trip you up. To say that what Jesus was about was simply getting people into heaven actually represents a gross underrepresentation, so much so that it's a misrepresentation. I'm not saying that he wasn't about that, but it's only a, a part of what he was about and, and only a small part at that. And if you take a small part of what Jesus was about and make it the most important thing or even the sole thing that he was accomplishing, well, I think that's a misrepresentation. It'd be like replying to someone who asked why Abraham Lincoln is so important to this country and saying that it's because he established the Department of Agriculture. I mean, he did, but that's not why he has a big marble statue on the National Mall. So back to keep Peter's confession and Jesus's reply that Peter is a rock star for coming up with it. It's not in Mark. In Mark's account, Jesus just orders the disciples not to say anything to anyone in conjunction with Jesus being the Messiah. Now, Matthew has that too, but only after the rock stuff. And it, it's not that Mark decided to leave that part out. Mark was written first, and Matthew used a copy of Mark's gospel in writing his own gospel. So if anything, Matthew added it. Perhaps more likely, whatever source Matthew was using besides Mark had it in there already. But the effect, though, of it not being there is instead of shifting the focus to Simon Peter and who he is, it keeps the focus squarely on Jesus and who he is, which Jesus doesn't want anyone to know about. So let's keep reading. Mark chapter 8, now verse 18. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So, the danger of being committed to Jesus is made quite explicit right here. Jesus tells the disciples that he's heading towards a showdown with the religious leaders in Jerusalem, and the end result is going to be that they're going to reject him, they're going to make him suffer, and they are going to kill him. And three days later, he'll rise again. But they didn't hear anything after the word killed. <laughs> that was a stopper. You know how you hear something stunning and you're so busy trying to wrap your head around it that your mind literally ceases to hear anything else? That's what's happening here. Uh, of course, the hearer of Mark's gospel already knows how the story ends, and they, they know about the crucifixion and the resurrection, as do we. And we also understand that the disciples didn't go to Jerusalem expecting Jesus to die. But let me unpack this just a little bit more so you'll understand their expectations a bit more. Peter has already said that he believes Jesus is the Messiah. And the fact that Jesus warned all of them not to say anything about it indicates that the other 11 shared the same belief and expectation. And of course, none of them expected the Messiah to die. In fact, the Messiah can't die. So if Jesus dies, that means that he is not the Messiah. A dead Messiah is a false Messiah by definition. But of course, Jesus doesn't call himself the Messiah. He calls himself the Son of Man. In, in normal speech, this is just another way of saying a man, a dude, a human. In fact, this is the way it's translated in Daniel 7.13, at least in the New Revised Standard Version, which is the translation I use, because it's generally a good translation, but they kind of blew it here. See, Daniel 7 is perhaps 
the messianic passage in the Old Testament, the one the Jews look to when they develop their idea of the Messiah. It starts with a vision by Daniel who sees four beasts arise out of the sea, each representing a different empire that oppressed the Jews. And then he sees a figure called the Ancient One sitting on a throne in heaven, an old guy with white clothes and white hair, the, the, the old guy white beard image that I talked about last week. This is where it comes from. It's God. And he takes away the dominion of the beasts. He dethrones them. And then in verse 13, Daniel says, As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented to him. But like I said, the, the New Revised Standard Version translators just really kind of blew it here because while they're technically correct, this is not some mere mortal. They, they should have just kept with the literal translation of the Aramaic of Daniel. And this is one of the few parts of the Old Testament that aren't in Hebrew, but in Aramaic. They should have just translated the Aramaic as son of man, as probably most of your translations do. And then in verse 14, it says, to him, the son of man, to him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. So the ancient one takes the dominion and kingship away from the four beasts and he gives it to the Son of Man, and everyone bows to him and to his eternal kingdom. So Jesus talking about the Son of Man dying just didn't make any sense. It, it certainly wasn't a faithful interpretation of this text, no matter how you slice it. I mean, how can a kingdom be eternal if the king dies? How can peoples, nations, and languages serve him if he's dead? It doesn't make any sense. Now, not for nothing, a, a lot of Daniel scholars, and I happen to share this viewpoint, think that this passage originally was pointing to the great Jewish rebel leader, Judas Maccabeus, as the one Daniel was writing about, who was the son of man who would deliver Israel from foreign domination, which in fact he did during the Maccabean revolt. Israel was free for about a hundred years or so, relatively so. But Judas was killed during the revolt. So the Jews started looking for someone else, which proves my point that you can't be the Messiah if you die. Plus, a, a kingdom of a hundred years is just a smudge shy of everlasting dominion. So in calling himself the son of man, and then saying that he was going to suffer and die, Jesus was messing up the whole scenario in Daniel. And with it, he was messing up the minds of the disciples. They, they all just went tilt. And then he called on them to be crucified with him, them and anyone who would follow him to Jerusalem, which, of course, they couldn't do. I mean, they were willing to die for him, but their deaths would be glorious deaths in battle as they fought for God's kingdom. That's the kind of deaths that they envisioned and were prepared to die, but not crucifixion. There's, there's no glory in crucifixion only shame. That's what it was designed for, shame and defeat. Now, of course, none of us are in that same situation. Thank God. I mean, literally, thank God. God's kingdom has advanced enough that in a lot, maybe even most places in the world, being a Christian isn't dangerous. And if you're watching this on YouTube, well, chances are that you're in one of those safe places. But there's another danger that we all face, and to understand it, we need to go back to Peter and Jesus and a part I kind of skipped over just a little bit. After Jesus tells all the disciples about the Son of Man being rejected and tortured and killed, Peter takes him aside and just lays into him. It says he's, he rebukes him, which kind of has the force of correcting him. And you can imagine the kind of things that Peter is saying to him. 
How maybe most people haven't studied the messianic portions of Daniel enough to understand all the son of man and ancient of days imagery, but they aren't as committed as he is. He's read them. He's studied them. He's listened to the rabbis teach about them. He's asked them questions. And he, Simon, newly anointed rock of the church, he understands the mysteries of the the apocalyptic sections of Daniel, even if they are written in Aramaic. And he's here to tell you that they don't say anything at all like what Jesus is talking about. Why, it's just bad biblical interpretation. It's liberalism. That's what it is. And Jesus, you better stop it because people are listening to you and you're going to put ideas in their heads and lead them astray. And they're not only going to lose their faith, they're going to lose their lives. Remember what you said about it being better to have a millstone hung around your neck and thrown into the sea for causing these little ones to stumble? Well, that's exactly what you are doing. And besides, we have all left houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and children and fields to follow you. That's how committed we've been and still are, most of us. But if you think for one moment, we did all of that just to watch you traipse into Jerusalem and let yourself be arrested and tortured and killed, well, you've got another thing coming. These men, these men have left everything to fight for you and to fight with you. And we are all willing to die doing it, but we need you to lead us, lead us, lead us into battle. And the Lord will raise up an army and give us I mean, give you the victory, just as Daniel saw it in his vision. But enough of this talk about being killed. If there's any dying to be done, we'll do it. But you, you, you must live so that you can receive the dominion and glory and kingship that the ancient one promised the Son of Man. Or something along those lines. He, I mean, he, he's, he's, he's trying to be respectful, right? He pulls Jesus aside. But... Jesus makes sure that the rest of the disciples are watching them. And then he says loud enough for them to all to hear, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Now, understand, Jesus isn't calling Peter the devil. He's not saying that he's in league with the devil or he's demon possessed or anything like that. This has nothing to do with devils or demons or fallen angels or anything like that. Neither is it a metaphor. In fact, he's using the Hebrew word Satan right there in the midst of a bunch of New Testament Greek. I mean, there's not a whole lot of Hebrew in the New Testament. It really wasn't a spoken language in the first century. Greek and Aramaic were the languages used by the Israelites like Peter and Jesus. In fact, most of the Old Testament that's quoted in the New Testament isn't Hebrew. It's actually the Greek Old Testament. But Jesus uses Hebrew. He uses the Hebrew word Satan. And in the Old Testament, that word, Satan doesn't have the force of a demonic figure. It means opponent, adversary, anything or anyone who was opposed to God or adverse to his ways could be said to be a Satan. And that is what Jesus is calling Peter. He's telling him that he's opposed to the things of God. He's standing in the way. God wants to go in one direction, and Peter not only wants to go in another direction, he's standing in the way of God. He wants, and he fully expects, God to stop going the direction he's going and start going the direction that Peter thinks he should go. And Peter thinks he should go this way because he, Peter, is committed and has studied the scripture, and he knows what God wants to do, and thus he expects God to to do it. And anybody who doesn't do what he knows that the scripture says is wrong, even if that person is Jesus. But here's the critical point. All of this happens after Peter makes the correct confession of faith. You are the Messiah. He knows who Jesus is. He believes in who Jesus is. He's accepted Jesus as his Messiah, his deliverer, the anointed one, son of God, second person of the Trinity. He's confessed him before men and angels. He's willing to die for Jesus. He's one of the really, 
really committed. But he doesn't know what Jesus is about. He knows what Jesus should be about, and he's fully committed to that, but he's not committed to whatever it is that Jesus says that he's going to be doing. And by not committed, I don't mean like most of the Christians you and I know who are, you know, committed enough to get in, but not committed enough to spend much time reading their Bibles or coming to churches or giving them money or serving in one of our ministries or, or whatever. You know, the, the 80% of the people who only do 20% of the work, leaving the really, really committed 20% of the rest of us to do 80% of the work. Although we're convinced that it's more like, you know, less than 10% of us doing more than 90% of the work. Those 80%, the less committed Christians, agree with the work and mission of the church. They just can't find it in them to contribute much time or money to the cause. But no, Peter is not not committed to what Jesus is about in that way. Peter is not committed to what Jesus is about because he disagrees with it. He believes it's wrong. He believes it's unbiblical. He believes that it's a betrayal of God and a betrayal of people like him and James and John and, and yes, even Judas Iscariot, men who have left everything, sacrificed everything, followed Jesus everywhere without a rock upon which to lay their heads at night, men who are ready to actually die fighting for Jesus. It's a betrayal what Jesus is doing. It's a betrayal of those who are the most committed to him. But Jesus didn't call them to fight for him because Jesus didn't come to fight. He, he came to bear witness to who God really is, a God of unconditional love, a God who won't win by killing all his enemies, but by loving them into submission, even if it means that some won't submit and in their rebellion against him will cause him and his anointed great suffering. That's what Jesus was about. And it's not like he hid it from us. Right from the start, he was saying, love your enemies. And that's not some casual throwaway line. It's central to what Jesus was about. And, and then we spend our time explaining why Jesus didn't really mean it the way that it sounds like it, you know, or, or saying that it only applies to individuals and not to nations and governments, as if nations and governments aren't composed of individuals. And do you know who opposed Jesus the most? The most committed. That's who. Those who recited their confessions of faith daily, whether it be, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, or you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. <laughs> the, the hardly committed don't know enough Bible to know that Jesus even said, Love your enemies. They're, they're not committed enough to read their Bibles. They're not committed enough to know what the Bible says. It takes a certain level of commitment to know it. And it takes a certain level of commitment to try to explain it all away. And that's the danger of commitment. It takes a, a Peter to be the adversary of Jesus. It takes a Saul breathing threats against the church, persecuting Jesus on the road to Damascus to stone even some more Christians. Often, maybe usually, when this passage is preached, we're, we're asked if we love Jesus enough to die for him. But I'm not going to ask that. Most of us don't know how to answer it anyway. What I want to know is, do you love Jesus enough to just stop standing in his way? It may appear, Lord, that I live my life for you. And it, it may look like my heart is righteous. 
that it's true. But you see me clearly in all that's dark inside. Lord, forgive me. Don't turn your eyes away from me. Lord, I will wake up and fall on my knees. I accept not only who you are, but what you are about. I will love my enemies and forgive those who have hurt me, even if it kills me, because that's the cross you've asked me to carry. That's the dying you're asking me to do. That's the death you died, the death that leads to resurrection life. So I repent, Lord, I return to you and I leave behind fear and sin and the darkness that they bring to my life. I repent and I bring all of me so that I might receive the life you have, the life which you offer to me. You are my king and I give myself to you and to your kingdom. Amen.